a swimmer, this means danger, shark. Sharks are supposed to be unpredictable, savage killers, man-eaters. Are they? Can something be done about them? Only when we find out more about how they recognize and attack their prey. Dr. Perry Gilbert of Cornell University has found some of the answers. This is the story of his investigation of the attack pattern of sharks on experiment. A large shark followed a merchant ship for several days. It was finally caught and brought on board. In its stomach were 27 items. Among them, a plastic cigar box, a tennis shoe, a jar half filled with nails, a carpenter's square, a flashlight, two soft drink bottles, a soup kettle, a raincoat, and 27 feet of tar paper in a roll. All in one shark. And sharks eat people, too. Shark kills actress in shallow cove. Fight by fiance. In a file at Cornell University is all the information available about every shark attack in any part of the world. Case 374. Spearfishing one half mile from shore at 10 a.m. in black suit. Water murky. Was reloading gun at surface when shark hit with great force, cutting legs cheeks and back. Forcibly pried jaws of shark loose. 30 stitches required. Case 376. Diving for abalone with companion in clear water, 25 feet deep. Pink swim trunks, faceplate, flippers. Victim rose high out of the water with faceplate missing and cried for help, then disappeared. Companion dived and saw a victim's torso protruding from the mouth of shark. Body never recovered. This file of shark attacks is maintained by the Shark Research Panel of the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Chairman, Dr. Perry Gilbert, Professor of Zoology at Cornell University. He's been studying sharks and related fish for 25 years. In his search for information about sharks, he's traveled from his laboratory in Ithaca, New York, thousands of miles to the coast of the United States, Tahiti, India, Australia, Japan, South Africa, all areas of dense population where shark attacks are a serious problem to anyone in the water. But water covers seven-tenths of the Earth's surface. Are sharks a danger all over the world? The man to answer that question is Dr. Gilbert. Sharks are found in all the waters of the world except Antarctica. There are about 250 species of them, some 35 known to be dangerous to man. Most of these dangerous ones are found between latitude 35 north and 35 south, where the temperature of the water is 70 degrees or warmer. Actually, I know of no other spot in the world where as many kinds of sharks may be taken as on a little island 53 air miles due east of Miami, known as Bimini. Most fishermen come to Bimini for marlin or tuna, but this is the Lerner Marine Laboratory a field station of the American Museum of Natural History. And one of its boats is going out after sharks. Everything is ready. 13 baited hooks on the rail. And at the stern, a retriever designed to bring a large shark back to the laboratory alive if they catch one. Out at sea, the baited hooks are thrown overboard one after the other. Each hook is made of quarter-inch steel and baited with two to three pounds of fish. The hooks sink to the bottom, 70 feet below.
when the end of the line is reached, a float marks its location. The men have to wait for a couple of hours before they'll know if there's a large shark on one of those 13 hooks. Now it's time to pull up the line. Will there be a man-eating shark on one of the hooks? The helmsman steers the boat down the line. The first hook comes up, the bait's still there. Hooks number two, three, and four are empty. At hook number five, the pulling gets harder. Is something on the line? Yes, a six-foot tiger shark. It could take off a hand with one bite. They disconnect the chain leader and hook and attach a rope to it. Now to get the shark to the stern of the boat and maneuver it into the retriever. There it is, 300 pounds of tiger shark, safe in the retriever. To prevent seawater from being forced into the shark's mouth, there's a panel at the front of the retriever. Enough water comes through for the shark to breathe normally as the men head back to the laboratory. Those are the large shark pens of the Lerner Marine Laboratory. Now the boat's back at the dock, but the job's not finished. The shark's in the retriever, not in the pen. They've got to get the shark out of the retriever, up onto the dock, and get that hook out with as little damage as possible, as quickly as possible. Now to remove that hook, and to avoid that mouthful of razor blades. The fishermen have brought back a man-eating shark, but will it live? It can't stay on the bottom too long. It has to swim to force water through its gills to get oxygen. At last, it begins to swim. Soon, it will be like the other sharks in the pen, a mysterious and dangerous animal that has dominated the sea for millions of years. It's one of the few animals on the face of the earth that hunts man as food. What makes it attack? And how does it go about it? What goes on inside of that prehistoric brain? During the school year, Dr. Gilbert teaches zoology. And so it was natural for him to look at the brain of a shark for possible clues to understanding its behavior. He found in the shark's brain that this section deals with waterborne vibrations, underwater sound. This section of the brain deals with chemicals in the water, the shark's sense of smell. And this section of the shark's brain deals with vision, from the relatively large part of the brain devoted to smell, Dr. Gilbert and other scientists reasoned that a shark probably smells its way to food. A shark has been called a swimming nose for a long time by fishermen. How can you find out for sure that a shark actually smells food? The following summer at Bimini, Dr. Gilbert prepared a simple but effective test of a shark's sense of smell. We used two ordinary household cellulose acetate sponges, one soaked in seawater and a second soaked in bonito juice. These sponges were of identical size, shape, and color. They were weighted and lowered simultaneously into a pen containing three active, healthy, young lemon sharks. Which sponge will the lemon sharks single out? Here you see a typical circling action, and the shark is circling 
the sponge soaked in seawater. The circling is not particularly active, nor are the circles tight. Now the shark turns to the sponge soaked in bonito juice. Note the tight circles and the activity. Now back to the cellulose acetate sponge soaked in seawater and then over to the sponge soaked in bonito juice. If it attacks this sponge, it probably has smelled it. It did. The sponge test and similar investigations of a shark sense of smell were convincing tests, but they were not conclusive. A scientist prefers to be more um, precise, to, to measure an internal response to a sense of smell, like a change in heartbeat, for instance. You've probably had an electrocardiogram taken as part of a medical examination. Electrodes are placed on your wrists and on your ankles and near your heart. The wavy line is a record of the electrical signals generated by your heart. Dr. Gilbert wondered if an electrocardiogram of a shark would show any change when it smelled food. He tried placing electrodes outside the shark and found that the heart was too well insulated with cartilage to detect any electrical change. Would it be possible to put an electrode inside the shark, near its heart? This had never been done before with a free-swimming animal. What he needed was a supply of sharks on which to try out his idea. And sharks are always available in pens at the Lerner Marine Laboratory in Bimini. But how can you get an electrode inside a free-swimming shark? Here is a young lemon shark swimming about the periphery of a concrete test pool. We will anesthetize this shark with a drug known as MS-222. It's related to benzocaine. We pour out 100 cc of this drug in a dilution of 1 to 1,000 and we introduce this drug into the mouth of the shark after netting it. We extricate the tail and note that tail as the shark passes out. With a rubber bulb syringe, we insert 100 cc of MS-222 into the mouth cavity and flood the gills. There goes the tail, it's dropped, it took 15 seconds to anesthetize this small lemon shark. It's then placed on a shark board and an exploring electrode is inserted just below the heart. The cable from that electrode is sutured to the belly and to the dorsal fin. And the shark is placed back in the pool and a cable leads from it to the electrocardiograph. Dr. Stephen Douglas places the indifferent electrode and the ground in the pool. And now the shark is free to move anywhere in that pool it wishes. And a continuous electrocardiogram is taken. Here is our first record coming off the EKG machine. A much better record taken subsequently is shown here. The elevations on the record indicate auricular and ventricular contractions and tell us a good bit about the activity of the heart. The record above is one taken when an olfactory stimulus was absent. The record below when an olfactory stimulus was introduced into the pool. You'll note the two records are similar. These do not tell us very much, therefore, about a shark's sense of smell. Here, for the first time, was a record of the heartbeat of a free-swimming shark. Valuable evidence to understanding how its heart works, but disappointing as an indication of a shark's reaction to smell. A shark's heartbeat did not seem to change when it smelled food. But perhaps the shark is not a swimming nose after all. Well, how about the uh, electrical signals in a shark's brain? Would they show any change when it smelled food? No one knew. And finding out wasn't easy. Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Hodgson, and the director of the Lerner Marine Laboratory, Robert Matheson, finally were able to record the brain waves of a shark.
them. Here's what they found out. This is the normal pattern of the electrical signals in a shark's brain. Here, tuna juice was added to the water. Now, this change clearly shows the shark smelled the tuna and reacted. Here was measured evidence that the shark can correctly be called a swimming nose. So to chase the swimming nose away, it made sense to find something sharks didn't like to smell. The early tests indicated sharks didn't like to smell copper acetate. But you can't see it dissolved in seawater. So a dye was added. Later, the two dry ingredients were issued as a packet during World War II. The packet was called Shark Chaser. Later, the copper acetate was tested on a variety of sharks and did not repel most of them. Yet the Shark Chaser seemed to work reasonably well. If the copper acetate didn't repel sharks, perhaps the dye did. Shark is a keen nose. Could it smell the dye? We placed a small lemon shark in the circular test pool. Note that it characteristically swims about the periphery of the pool. Then we placed in this pool a quart jar of nigrosine dye. Will this deflect its swimming movements? Yes, it does. The shark avoids the dye. Does it smell or does it see the dye? When we plug the nostrils, eliminating the sense of smell, the shark still avoided the dye cloud. To test whether a shark was repelled visually by the dye, we had to clear the pool. Then we had to temporarily blind the shark. To do this, we anesthetized it. And then we placed black patches or eye occlusers beneath the immovable upper and lower lids of the eye. These do not damage the eye, and as long as they are in place, the shark is totally blind. We returned the shark to the cleared pool, washed the MS-222 out of the gills by moving it slowly back and forth through the clear water. The shark recovers quickly swims rather awkwardly about the pool at first, but after two hours has made a normal recovery. At that time, we place a quart jar of nigrosine dye in the pool. And the question is, will the blinded shark avoid the dye? No, it does not. This test illustrates that the dye acts as a visual repellent, and it further suggests that the shark's sense of vision and its importance has been underestimated. The eye of the shark took on new significance to Dr. Gilbert, and he began studying it in great detail. He carefully examined the structure of the eyes of 16 different species, and found that most sharks can't see color, nor can they see things in great detail. But sharks can see small differences in light and shadow, and especially things that move. As Dr. Gilbert continued to study the shark's eyes, he saw something never seen before. This is a model of a shark's eye, which is pretty much like your own eye. Light enters the lens at the front and is focused onto the retina, which sends an electrical signal to your brain. Some of the light goes through the retina and is absorbed behind it. A shark's eye works in the same way in bright light. In dim light or in murky water, Dr. Gilbert found the shark's eye is similar to the eye of a cat or a deer or an alligator. Their eyes seem to shine in the dark. Here's why. The light that goes through the retina hits mirror-like cells that reflect the weak light back through the retina again. The animal's retina gets a double dose of dim light and it can see in the dark you see the light shining back through their lenses. 
Here's the extraordinary feature of the shark's eye discovered by Dr. Gilbert. Only in the shark are these absorbing cells movable. When the shark's in bright light, they move down over the silvered plates. In dim light, they pull back. Bright light, they're down. Dim light, they're up. A very unusual eye. Does the remarkable eye of the shark play a significant role in locating food? Here are sharks approaching food. As they attack, are they using their eyes? To answer questions like that, Dr. Gilbert returns to the shark pens at Bimini. There's a supply of large sharks swimming around in this holding pen. Dr. Gilbert selects a normal, healthy shark and isolates it here in this operating pen, temporarily blinds it, then later releases it into the observation pen. At the moment, he has the test shark isolated at this end of the operating pen. Remember, this is a living, fighting, 350-pound man-eating shark. We use a pump-type garden sprayer to deliver the anesthetic, MS-222. And the object is to insert that brass nozzle into a single gill slit. There's quite a bit of action at this time. We finally get the nozzle in a gill slit and deliver about one quart of the anesthetic. The shark is now partially anesthetized, but not completely knocked out. In this condition, we can open the mouth and insert the nozzle into the mouth and spray all ten gills, five on each side of the head. It takes about a minute and a half to completely anesthetize the shark. It's then raised horizontally on a strap stretcher. If we raised it vertically, the mesenteries holding the viscera would tear and internal hemorrhage would result. Oftentimes we have to give it an additional dose of anesthetic once it's reached the dock. Now it's just about out. These lemon sharks are among the most active with which we work. We trim eye occlusors to size. And we slip them beneath the immovable upper and lower lids. Oftentimes there's quite a bit of action at this point. They go in very readily. That eye is now occluded without damage to the cornea. We trim the occlusor for the other eye. And we slip it beneath the immovable upper and lower lid. The shark is now temporarily blinded. And we lower it into the pen horizontally. We roll the shark over and head it into the incoming tide which washes the MS-222 out of the gills. It takes about 15 minutes to half an hour for the shark to make a full recovery. As the shark returns to normal, a huge chunk of marlin is pulled out into the observation pen. The elements of the experiment are ready. The blinded shark, marked with a red ribbon, and the bait. Will the blinded shark attack it? Dr. Gilbert's question was asked with the help of his microscope. To 
get an answer, he needs an aqualon and an underwater motion picture camera. That cage on the left is to protect him from the shark. Remember, a normal shark attacks like this. Now the blinded shark is ready. Will it be able to find its prey and attack it? It seems to have picked up the scent of the marlin, comes toward it, Time after time, the blinded shark approaches the marlin and never once attempts to attack it. For more than four hours, Dr. Gilbert watches and photographs. Here is pretty good evidence that in this particular shark, vision played an important role in guiding it to target. But this is true of only this individual, and we must work with several individuals of this species. We also must work with several species known to be dangerous to man before we can generalize as to the role of vision in guiding a shark to target. With so many different kinds of sharks and thousands upon thousands of unpredictable individuals in each species, is there any kind of pattern to their attack? Dr. Gilbert has found that sharks, in general, attack like this. At long range, Sharks pick up vibrations in the water, especially unusual vibrations, a wounded fish, for instance. At closer distances, the shark's nose picks up the scent and starts to home in on it. Then, in the last few feet, the shark uses its remarkable eyes to attack and seize its prey. As scientists like Dr. Perry Gilbert of Cornell University find out more about sharks, they come closer to finding, testing, and perfecting effective measures to prevent shark attacks. They continue to ask how and why, and they get their answers from experiment. Thank you. 